this is Daniel Garza and welcome to another episode of Put It Together Podcast Conversations. We're going to give a couple of seconds for people to chime in. My guest host today is Guy Noland. Remember, uh, as you're logging in, please share this and pass it around. So we'll give a couple of seconds for everybody to chime in. How are you doing, sir? Excellent. Yeah, well, we can pretend to chit-chat and be interested in each other. For All right. A while. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's kind of hard. I kind of have a face for radio, so this is throwing me off a little bit. You know, but... I will. I, I told you the picture that's on the post. Yes. By the way, I'm glad. Oh yeah. Oh, so Daniel asks <laughs> me to send him a picture, a headshot, uh, which I do. Which you know, I look. You're supposed to look pretty good yeah. in your headshot. And um, uh, and the response I get is, <laughs> "Wow, you look really cute in this picture." <laughs> You did. Well, like, well, thanks, man. Like, uh, because I, I, I don't, I, I, told you I don't I normally, don't I guess, look, look decent. So, well, you, you're, you're shaved different in, in that other, in the photo. I am. Yeah. You only have the goatee and it's nice and yeah, clean. Yeah. But now I'm, I'm more, um, more of a bear. Yeah. Even though yeah. I'm not gay. No. But I'm more but, of a bear. But if you were. Gay, if I was gay, then I'd be If you were bear. gay, you would be a bear. Uh, but since you're straight, you're a white guy. <laughs> <laughs> More of a yeah, a redneck. I don't think in the white in the straight world you have a title. I don't. No, you know, I don't. I mean, you could right by image only. Hey, everybody, how's it doing, Eric? Welcome, everybody. Uh, people are joining us now. This is putting together conversations. I am your host, Daniel Garza, with my co-host today, Guy Nolan. He's been a guest on Put It Together podcast, which was a very interesting. Uh, show we talked a lot about uh comedy recovery um just living we did we did we did um thank you for joining me uh, i appreciate my pleasure. this no hey you came to me so i can't you yeah, can't what say, am i saying no you can't say i knew where you i lived. tried to hide i you know didn't answer the door but he kept knocking yeah that's you know how it is once you let a mexican in the house we it's like a vampire. Don't give us your address. Right. Always meet us at a restaurant because we right. will find our way. <laughs> uh, I appreciate it, though. Yeah. And uh, today's uh, is today's kind of special. Yeah. Why? Um, I had my math wrong in the last two episodes. Today uh, is my twelfth uh, recovery birthday. So I've been thank you. I've been clean and sober for twelve years today, uh, and I'm. That's I, a huge accomplishment. That's by the way. really good. I was looking for. I wanted. 13. I was pushing 13 because I wanted to be a teenager again. You know, I know my 13. Is that what you got on your 13? That's 13? 13. He can't see it. We'll have to take a picture and we'll post it uh, of his shoe. He's trying to show me his underwear, people. So, uh, But uh, thank you everybody for joining us. I got underwear on my 13. And that, I brought a show and tell. This is a, you're like a cap. Yes, it is a cap. This is an Alaska cap that my friend uh, Bill Cook who was my roommate at the time in, in Houston, he had just gone to Alaska, brought it back, and then I went to rehab, and I wore this almost all through rehab. Three months. That's great. That's uh, a good keepsake. Yeah, and I haven't worn it since. Never? I, no. The, the day I got home after rehab, it went in my closet, and that was it. That, this was the rehab cap. So when I become rich... Ri <laughs> when I become famous... And there's like, a, I have the memorabilia room in my house. Right. This will go up as the rehab cap. Nice. So now you know. All right. Now you know. Um, so today's topic. Yeah. Uh, funny thing about recovery. Funny thing. <laughs> funny thing about recovery. People don't normally think that recovery can be funny. Uh, well, it's, I think because it's, <laughs> it's only usually funny in hindsight. <laughs> uh, I, don't think, I don't think people uh, find the humor in it. Uh, uh, in the here and now, but uh, yeah, yeah. Now, now that we pretty much talked about it, you are also clean and sober. Yeah, I just uh, had my 16th birthday wow. on June 6th. But you only look like 21. I know. Well, that's because <laughs> I got sober when I was four. That's, a, that's, yeah. that's how white people do it. <laughs> yeah. Start young and young. Congratulations yeah, on that. Yeah, this is what 21 looks like. <laughs> like <a> white. <laughs> it's not, no. Don't grow up, kids. Yeah, uh -uh, Don't grow up. Uh -uh. Uh, congratulations on that. Thanks, man. Uh, Thanks. For those of you that uh, have been following me on Put It Together Podcast, know that guy was on my one of my episodes. I'll look up right now and see which episode he was. But um, that's when I kind of found out that you were clean and sober. Mm -hmm. um, is that the reason for the topic? Well, actually, when, 
when I asked you what you wanted to talk about, you gave me a couple of different right. subjects. Right. Which yeah. were? Well, uh, well uh, you know, sobriety is things that I can talk about uh, ad infinitum, sobriety being one of them. Also, you know, uh, growing up in a religious family is something that uh, uh, I can go on for hours and hours about. I know that sounds exciting. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, but, but sobriety is one of those things that we have in common and, uh, you know, uh, it's an easy subject to talk about. So, well, so, so let's start cause we, I know people are going to be like, well, if you're going to talk about sobriety, there's got to be some like dirt in there. <laughs> um, the first time you got like shit based drunk. Oh, that would have been, um, well, okay. So let's go back. All right. So. So first of all, my, like I come from a long line of uh, of drunks, right? Oh, okay. So I'm Irish. That's good to know. Yeah. So uh, so I go way back. I go back. Uh, my uh, I had a, had a great great uncle somewhere back in the day who who died when he fell off his horse drunk and broke his neck. Oh shit. So we we can go way back. Um, uh, when I was a kid, uh, I remember my first drink was my aunt who subsequently died of. Uh, uh, liver cancer. Um, not, not funny. Not no, that, but no. oh, a little. That's a little. See, we're comedians, so uh, we we kind of laugh in inappropriate places. Uh, it is a little funny, but she would laugh. Point is, first when I was six years old, she was drinking a beer. She drank Miller Lite. She says, and I said, "What is that, Aunt Sherry?" She said, "Oh, it's a beer." She says, "I said, can I have some?" And she said, "Okay, here." She gives me a sip, but she turned her back. And by the time she turned back around, I had down the whole beer. Wow. Um, so that I was off to the races. Should have known. <laughs> should have known. That, was, that should have been, uh, yeah, should have seen that coming. Uh, but my first drunk, I think, was when I was 13. We had, uh, uh, some of my buddies had a party in, in my, my friend's garage. Uh, invited a couple of uh, eighth grade girls over and had his big brother buy us a, a 12-pack of uh, Schaefer Tallboys. Wow. And uh, that was my first real drunk. And um, and I loved it. You know, that's how you know. I mean, you know, people, you know this, but they always say that you know that there's something different about us chemically, our makeup, right? Yeah. And 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 I have no doubt that I'm different. That alcohol affects me differently than it does. I can't say you, no, they, no. but but like like what we call normies, normal people, right? Because I take a drink. Like my wife's a normie. Right, and she's she's got a wine club, and she does her, you know, she's all, she loves her wine and stuff. But she'll 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 have like, you know, a week, maybe two or three glasses a week, right? And she'll take a she'll 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 drink a glass of wine, and then she'll maybe have a second one if it's like a you know a celebration or something, and then she'll say, oh, I'm starting to feel it. I need to stop. <laughs> Which I and I you know in jest always say, you are the worst alcoholic i've ever met in in the sense of you don't make a good alcoholic like you don't know how to be an alcoholic at all because for me once you start feeling it is not when you stop no that's when you you kick it in the second gear right i want to go until i don't feel it anymore. right yeah right so so don't so so these normies you know uh i i look and i go see that's how i know that it affects you differently than it does me because if you felt what i feel you wouldn't stop. You know what I mean? Yeah. You would never stop. You'd, you'd stop until... That was my whole thing is that uh, I couldn't... You know, that's why I couldn't stop. It was just... It was too good. It felt too good. And for me, you know, you hear people talk about in the rooms all the time, oh, it stopped working. It stopped working. It never stopped working for me. Yeah. And it always worked all the way up to the end. I, I, I continually will always say that the reason I stopped is because I got caught. Like, finally the court caught up with me and uh, said... Oh, you were court ordered? I was court ordered. Oh. So finally the court said, here's your choices. Jail for a year, uh, rehab for three months. And I thought about it. I was like... Seriously, right? I was like, are we talking like... <laughs> like, are we talking like like Mexican movie jail? Right. Or are we talking HBO Oz jail? Right. Because I would go to HBO Austria. <laughs> there's a lot of action there. Like, like there's hot guys there. It's a gay man. I was like, you're going to throw me into a, a room full of other men who have sex with men? Sign me up. <laughs> That's I, not I, prison. I, but uh, 
it, it, it took some convincing to for me to go to rehab. Because I'm kind of like with, with you on the same level. There are pictures in our family of most of the boys when they were like a year old with the beer. Right, right. Where the, the grandfather or the father is giving them a the beer. Yeah. I'm like, you're pretty much setting us up. Like, right there. That, that I'll, and, and again, this is not judgment on anybody else who's watching the show today. This is just how our, our lives are and how we find the funny in it. And uh, for those of you that are joining so far, thank you for joining us. Uh, hello to Eric, Bill, and Davey. Thank you for joining us. We are talking with Guy Noland, this particular conversations, and we're talking about uh, funny things about recovery uh, because today I'm celebrating uh, 12 years clean sober, and actually, it, I can't find anybody that I would want to celebrate it with. Ah, oh, thank you. So this is awesome. Excellent. Um, and I'll tell you guys how I, we met because that has its own story too. Um, part of my stand up early on, before I was doing real stand up, was telling people, it was like, there are no alcoholics in the Latino community. There are no alcoholic Mexicans. Right, right. Because we can drink on Tuesday. Right, right, right. Because it's Tuesday. Right. Thursday. Right. Because we mow the lawn. Right, right. <laughs> same, with, same with Ireland, right? You go to Ireland. We, my wife and I just got back from Ireland. Like, hey, hey, what's that? You know what I mean? Like, because everybody's a drunk. Like, yeah. If everybody, that's normal, right? Being a drunk is yeah. normal. Not to stereotype Irish, but I can do that. Send Irish, the people right? who are not drinking right. to therapy. Right. What's right. wrong with yeah, you? Yeah, exactly. You are bringing shame to this family for not drinking. Exactly. Um, first time you got high. I mean, really stoned? That's a good question. Did, did you uh, do hard drugs? Nah, nah, I never, I was, you know, I was always afraid of, of like... Getting addicted? Well, no, okay, okay, here's a good story, here's a good story. Like, when my first time I did I cocaine, all right? First time I did cocaine, I was 13 years old. What? My babysitter gave it to me. <laughs> Whoa! Who was the youth pastor at our church. <laughs> Guy or girl? <laughs> Guy. And he was gonna. He was. Gonna, he's like. He because he, he. He was a. He was a character. But he. He was gonna. You know. He's, he was gonna take me out. He was gonna go out to a party. And he was. He was babysitting. And he was gonna take me out to this party with him. And and, and he pulled out this little vial, of cocaine. And uh. And he, he says, well, "You gotta try this. You know. Will you try this?" And I said, "Okay." So he says, "Open your mouth." And so I open my mouth. And he blew some down my throat. He says, well, "How do you feel?" I says, "Numb." He says, "Right, right." He says, "Now, now snort some." And I said, uh. So I did, and he's like, "Don't you feel happy now?" And I was like, <laughs> "I felt happy before. Like I'm like, I did, it did nothing for me. I'm like, why?" And so that I never did it again because I was like, "That's a waste of money. Like that 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 had did nothing for me." Um, uh, so that was the, the only, one and only time I ever did cocaine. I tried speed a couple times, but that just made me really violent. Like really oh, wow. angry, like really aggressive and violent. Like I took it. I took some before I, pl I played in a, a, a softball game when I was in high school, and I like I almost got in three fights during that game. That that's no fun, you know. I don't want to do that. And yeah. So and then pot was I, I smoked it all through high school, but for me, I you know like literally the 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 the, the name dope, <laughs> right? I, I go I get that right because my brain <laughs> would just turn to jello. And I was like, I don't like that. But I would do it because my friends would do it. And I could tell you a hundred stories about pot, you know, but, but being able to get anything that where I could get lost in my own backyard, like that's dope, <laughs> right? And I was like, this is, I don't, this is not, and I smoke it. We go to a party and I'd, I'd get high with my friends and then we go to the party and then five minutes in the party, I'd burn out and I'd be sitting in the corner, you know, falling asleep. And I'm like, that's, that's not, not fun. I, this so, not, so you were... Merely liquor, and yeah. Alcohol. Because, because, yeah, because none of the other stuff did anything for me. I didn't really, it, it didn't, really, I didn't really like it. It didn't. And then, like hallucinogens, like acid or or uh, you know anything like that, was scared me. I was like, I, because I'm really creative, and my friends who didn't have a creative bone in their body would tell me the stuff that they would see when they were tripping. Oh wow! And I'm like, if you're seeing that, like. Then my brain is gonna like make up some some really crazy. I, I can't imagine. I mean, yeah, yeah. Because okay, now, now I feel like, damn, dude. Because we're we're about the same age. Yeah, I'm forty eight. Yeah, forty eight. Yeah, so we're the same age. Yeah. Because I feel like 
Like, I lived so much harder than you. Yeah, no. Like, don't I, don't I, let I, the I, life... I know. User. I look like I've lived harder than you, but that's just because I have less melatonin it, it, in my It's speech. the Irish in you. Yeah. Um, um, I... Okay, truth... Alcohol, well, of course, I had that first... And anybody, if anybody in my family is watching this, you know that parties, like, there's always a, the dad's like, give him a beer. And like, oh, mom's always like, no, he's too young. Yeah. And then you sneak away with the cousins and they'll, they'll get you a beer. So I remember being like 10, 12 and sneaking up a drink of beer. And I always liked the bitterness, the flavor. I, I really was about the flavor. Like, I, I enjoyed, this is Mexico too, so I enjoyed the Mexican beers. Right. But, my parents had a. I hope my sister's not watching this because. <laughs> uh, my parents had a a bottle of rum in the living room, and it was in, in a little canister. And I would steal shots and put it in my Kool Aid <laughs> when when I was home alone, and that's what I would drink. And that's I, I felt so grown up because I had that, that was my version, which I guess it was a cocktail. Right. That was my version of watching HBO because it was the adult channels drinking a cocktail. And I don't think I ever... I didn't know what getting drunk was. How old were you? Like 11. Oh, okay. 12, maybe. So you wouldn't get buzzed or anything? No, I I don't know. Oh. Because, I mean, do you ever really know the first time? Like... Well, that's what I'm trying to think of the first time I got high. I don't... I can't remember. I mean, I got high a lot in high school. Like, Like, you have nothing... A bunch of stories, but I don't remember, like, what the first time was and by the way for everybody watching uh this is putting together conversations my co-host today is guy nolan and we're talking about funny things about recovery uh celebrating my 12 years of clean sober uh if you have any questions uh or comments please feel free to write them out our laptop is right here and we'll answer anything or uh add to the story of anything uh i don't think there's an edit button today we're we're open yeah pretty much um now the first time i officially got drunk like the first time that i knew i was drunk i didn't go to my high school graduation i i used that money to throw a private party at my parents ranch <laughs> yeah you know so there were uh, all these friends from mexico there was about six of us seven of us i don't think anybody in my family knows about this uh, i have to burn this i don't think this is gonna go on youtube but we went out, and in Mexico, there's this drink called sangria. Ooh, yeah. You know what sangria is? Oh, yeah. yeah, so it's like tequila and this red drink, uh, which is basically... Uh, it's, it's like wine, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So you mix it, and they call them vampiros in Mexico, and that's the mixture of the tequila, the sangria, a little lime, uh, a little uh, grapefruit soda. Oh, it's the best. Uh, we ran out of the sangria, so basically, we were doing grapefruit and tequila. Then we ran out of the soda. I was going to say, you ran out of grapefruit. So then it was just tequila shots. This was, of course, like July. I'm on the floor outside with my cheek on the ground because it's cold. And I'm like, nobody move me. And I'm right at the edge where the dirt is. So if I threw up, everything just went there. <laughs> and I swore that I was never going to drink again. Mm. Ever. Mm. Until the next morning. Yeah. And... Uh, that was my high school graduation party. I don't think I've ever had a, I don't think I've ever had a, I'm never going to drink again. I mean, I've had the, you know, continual, that sucked, and boy, that was awful, and I just want to kill myself, but, you know, it was, <laughs> I was like, I was always like, yeah, but I'll get over it. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll push through this. I, I'll get, I'll get, I'll get to the next one. But see, the other thing, too, were you a blackout drinker? I have. No, I never blacked out. Dude. Never blacked what, out. Why are you doing here then? I, that's what I'm saying, right? It's like, well, in the beginning of my recovery, I was like, I'm, I'm, I didn't think I was an alcoholic, right? Because I was listening to all these people, you know, tell their stories. And I, of course, I'm in the beginning listening for the differences rather than the similarities, right? Right. So I'm like, I never blacked out. I never had to get up in the middle of the night to have a drink, you know? I didn't drink as soon as my feet hit the floor in the morning. I didn't like to drink during the daylight hours right i only like to drink at night but here's the thing is that i would i'd drink until five six in the morning and then sleep until two o'clock in the afternoon so night wasn't that far <laughs> off you know what i mean but i was like oh yeah i never i remember everything <laughs> i wasn't a day drinker i just slept through it all <laughs> seriously like my doctor asked me once he goes do you drink do you drink a lot and i'm like define a lot 
And he goes, every day. And I went, no. And I thought, I drink every, every night. night. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, no, for real. I don't know. I drink every day. No, I never drink during the day, Doc. See, cause I even remember the first time I tried Coke. I was 20 years old. I lived in Dallas. There was a gay bar in Dallas called The Wave, which is not there anymore. For anybody in Dallas, this was over off of Maple Avenue. Everything's big in Texas. Everything's big in Texas. And the boyfriend, the living boyfriend that I had at the time was three years older than me. So he was like 23. And I thought I wasn't cool enough. To do coke? No, to, to, to be, be with, with him. Because oh. we lived together and, and he, was, he was older. And I was like, I'm, I'm not cool enough. And I need to do something to, to prove my coolness. Right, right. So... This girl that I was working with had friends who got drugs and I asked her to get us a couple of 20s, which I didn't know then. I, I didn't know how to associate that a 20 meant $20. Right, right, right. And, and so she did. We were, we went to the bar. These are the things I remember. I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday, but this I can remember. Right. We were outside the bar on a cassette. This is how old that is. This is 1991, a cassette of Seal, the singer, Seal. Uh, and the cassette was playing Crazy, the song Crazy. That song for a lot of times was a trigger. I could not listen to that song. Uh, uh, but he was playing, so on the box of Seal, that was my first time I ever snorted a cork. Now, did, what did it do for you? Did, it, did you feel a difference? Well, that's what I'm trying to say. Is like I had nothing to compare to. Right. So I didn't know... What it was supposed to do. All I know is that I, I did not sleep that night. Oh. Because we, we kept doing that. Right. And I, I just kept going like, I don't feel anything. Right. Well, see, that was, this, and that's why, I think that's why I never did meth, right? Was because the first time I, I, I remember meth being introduced uh, was in a high school party. And I walked into this room. These guys were doing meth. And they're like, hey, you want some? I'm like, what is it? And they said, meth. And I go, what does it do? They go, it keeps you up for three days. And I was like, no. <laughs> Why would I want that? You know, I don't want to do that. <laughs> so that was like a, a real God shot. That, because I found out later, you know, after I got sober, is that, you know, uh, my friends who did meth, when they were drinking, they said, oh, yeah, it was a perfect cure for hangovers. Because it would just pull you right off the hangover. Oh, wow. Like, Ooh, I'm glad I never found that out. You know what I mean? Because I think I might have I might have jumped right into that, you know, because there's some... Some pretty bad hangovers. And if you could just, if you got a hangover cure, you're not thinking, well, it's meth. Like, it's like, who cares, right? Whatever. It's like taking a pill, right? Uppers and downers. I, yeah. I was never into the pill thing. No, me either. But I did, I, I know it feels like we're, this is not a bragging show. This is like, hey, this is who we were. And this is, I, I do believe that all War the, stories. All the crap that I did makes me who I am now. Oh, for sure. But do you feel like, what you find funny versus people who have not had that kind of journey is a little more good. <laughs> well, I think, I think there's two things going on, right? Not just that, right? Not just our, the addiction background because you live through some dark stuff and uh, you, you can't, I mean, you, you have to laugh at it, right? Or you would put a bullet in your mouth, right? Mm -hmm. you, you, so you have to learn to laugh at it. And, we, and, and, and then on top of that, being comics... We just tend to be on the darker side of humor anyway, right? Yeah. And people don't. And so if it's not politically correct, that's right where we go, oh, right? Oh, totally. You know, totally. that's like we dive right into that, um, which is kind of, you know, every comedian will tell you is kind of the, you know, the bane of, of a comic's life is all this political political. Correct Pregnant. shit that's going on. <laughs> can't even say yeah, it. Yeah, I can't even say it. It's, 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 that's, that's cursing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, but I do think, yeah, that it comes, you know, from, because you got, if you got to look back and laugh, you have to, or you just kill yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the stuff that, that, that I've been through or stuff that I've put other people through, you know, that's the other thing, right? Like wow. nowadays, like I, you know, all these, 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 uh, celebrities who are being crucified for, for a tweet from 15 years ago or whatever, 10 years ago. You know, like there's no room for reconciliation. There's no room for forgiveness. And I'm like, oh, I'm so glad there wasn't cell phones or like cameras and stuff around back then. Like I'm 16 years sober, so they hadn't invented this, the, the iPhone yet. And I'm like, whew, 
man, and, and there was no Twitter uh, back then or anything. So I'm like, oh man, I dodged a bullet on that. Because if, if I had to explain some of my behaviors, ooh, I'd be in big trouble. I think uh, when I went to rehab, MySpace was still that thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I... I don't think I could, I, I probably would have had to change my name and move to another country. <laughs> yeah. Uh, obviously not a Latin country, or maybe I should have because I could mix in. But I think now, okay, um, I got busted having sex in a lesbian bar. <laughs> <laughs> so many things wrong with that statement. In the bathroom, three times. <laughs> Three times by the same security guard, the same dude. Not the same night, I hope. No. Oh, all right. No, all right, no. Right. But, but obviously in the same <laughs> Three season. Three times in a row. Probably in the same summer or something. Right. That in the end, I ended up dating the security guard for a little while. Because we, we, he, he, he kept telling me, he's like, you must be high. And I was like, yes. And I think like the last time... So he must have saw something good in there. He was right? like, hey, you're, I'll give you. I like your moves, son. I'll, I'll tell you this. Security guards always know where the best drugs are. Just, <laughs> just to put that out there. Bouncers at bars, they got the end. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not, that I'm, not that I'm saying. And if you're a security guard, don't. Doesn't mean you're yeah, a gay drug doesn't, dealer. Doesn't. But you have Relax. The, but you have the potential. Not just yeah. that. Um, but if you ever wanted to be. Uh, for a while there, acid, X were my thing uh when i was doing x as it was so stupid, oh, see, i never did x the the way that i knew it was working and my my caliber of like oh this is good shit right here was i would always see a chubby redhead woman in the room <laughs> so like was she really there no oh. <laughs> no i didn't know that x was a hallucinogen i i well, that's how I knew. I, 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 well, is it? Everybody ever done X? It was it supposed to be because I don't want to look it up right now. But um, the the first time again, Dallas. All my all my history all starts in Dallas, uh, which is probably why I haven't been back in a while. Uh, <laughs> I just had a flashback right now. Uh, I was in downtown Dallas uh, at this bar called. Club Uno at the West End area, and this was an after-hours bar. You you went there about midnight, one o'clock in the okay. morning, and you stayed till like four o'clock in the morning. And they didn't sell liquor after two, but you can always find the drug dealers in the area. Oh, right, right, so you right, would find right. Acid or X or some uh, kind of one of those. In t Texas is two o'clock. That's the cutoff. Yeah. Okay. But this was like an after-hours bar, no alcohol. But you were high, and the first time. I did X, we were there, and I remember turning around and there was this chubby red-haired woman staring at me. And I, I looked at my friend, I was like, why is she staring at me? And he's like, who? And I'm like, her, the red-haired. And I just kept going and he's like, dude, you're high. I'm like, probably. So that was, I know the story sounds insane, but that was my thing. If I took X and I saw the red-haired woman, I knew it was working. If I didn't see her, I'd be like, dude, this, 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 this is shitty. <laughs> So now if you ever see me do stand-up or see me out, now you know where my brain comes from. That's safe. Yeah, see, the 2 o'clock in the morning thing, that used to that used to put a real crimp in my my drinking. Like, that whole thing was... I, you know, I see, I, I'm kind of this proponent of take away the 2 a.m. rule because if you let drunks just drink... Like in, is till they till they they can't drink anymore. They'll just stay where they are. You know what I mean? Like they'll just. The reason we have drunk drivers is because <laughs> they they're close four, they close down. <laughs> so they're out on the road. See, so just let them stay where they are. They'll pass out. We're not just good looking. Yeah, we have, we have ideas. We have ideas. But but see, because th that was the thing. Is like like I had this like you know how delusion you delusional you are when you're in your disease and. And I had this thing that, like, I had convinced myself that if I didn't keep booze in the house, then I didn't have a problem, right? right. So I knew just exactly how much alcohol I needed to get me where I needed to be for the night, you know, to put me out, right? So, and it was always one of those big jugs of wine, right? One of those big, like, two-liter jugs. Like, that was... stop. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, no, no. No, actually, oh, the were one... Were you classy? I, I, was, I was a little classier than that. <laughs> 
But I but I'd take anything in a pinch, right? Um, but but or just two bottles of wine, right? Because because I had given up on hard alcohol. Because again, I, you know, I don't. Oh no, I don't drink the hard stuff. I no. just drink wine, right? Wine. I'd wine drink, the, wine. And I would drink and I would drink like in like like those big mugs, like of course. those big beer steins. Oh yeah. So that if anyone asked me, I could say I've only had two drinks. <laughs> and, and I. And that was legit, right? <laughs> but here's the thing: is that 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 big two liter thing of wine didn't always work, right? Like once in a blue moon, it wouldn't get me where I needed to be. So, which meant that every night at at quarter to two, I'd be, you know, about three quarters of the way through that or halfway through that bottle, and I'd go, oh, I better get another bottle just in case, just in case, right? So, so then I would get. In my car and drive, wow! At at a quarter to two in the morning down to Seven Eleven, and and this is like every night. I go in, and 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 what Seven Eleven does is they they put their their clocks ahead like ten minutes yeah. to make sure that they, they do that. that they don't accidentally sell the two o'clock. So then I'd get in there, and some, a lot of times I'd make it in right under, right under the the, the bell, right. <laughs> But every now and again, I'd get in there and they would say, no, it's two o'clock, we can't sell. But they'd always have the bottles of wine sitting out. So then what I would do is I would take the bottle, I'd grab a bottle and I'd put it on the counter and I'd take out a $10 bill and I'd put that on the counter and I'd say, I'm not stealing it and you're not selling it. And I'd grab the bottle, leave the 10 and I'd walk out the door. And, uh, the but that's <laughs> that's desperate, right? <laughs> that's pretty. And then and then I heard about like again once I got into recovery, people out hear stories and people were like, oh yeah, I would drink mouthwash after two a.m. I was never there. Uh, not po- that it's bad. Not, not that we're like yeah. Right, cologne. Like people talk about, they drink their cologne and stuff. And I was like, I never did that, but probably only because I never thought of it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have known. But my talking about drugs, my favorite was the. Uh, the two liter Parmesan Chablis. This is like cheap shit back then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was a twist bottle. And me and my neighbor, who were both heartbroken at the time, would listen to Patsy Cline on the balcony of my apartment, again in Dallas. And we would walk down to the bar because we would finish, we would start on that jug about eight o'clock. So about 10.30 or so, it was done. And then you had to like freshen up a little bit. And then we would walk down to, it's the Hidden Door Bar there in Dallas, Texas, gay bar. It's kind of seedy. <laughs> Wait, um, called the Hidden Door? The hidden door. Yeah, I know, right? Go figure it out. Like, Shocking. And we would go there to, to finish off the night. Okay. Uh, for those of you joining us, we have some people on us uh, on the show. I mean, following us today. Sorry, my head is already out there. Uh, this is Putting Together Conversations. My guest host today, Guy Nolan, actor and comedian. We are talking about the funny things about recovery. We're not condoning you to go drink, so don't take it that way. But we're just sharing our own uh, stories of, of our times. as. Because if you do, you could wind up like right. this. You could look like this. And, you know, yeah. I was a white young man at one point. And... <laughs> I was a hairy woman <laughs> at one point. And right. today we are, we're actually uh, celebrating my 12-year uh, clean and sober anniversary. Ooh. And I thought... Actually, it, it, it was kind of spontaneous because I had asked him to, to be on the show and today was the day he was available. And then as I was looking through the calendar, I was like, oh, today is uh, my, my birthday, basically. And tomorrow I'll be in San Diego um, at the bar. At the bar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that 12 years and just going right out. I will be yeah, that is. down in San Diego at, at the meeting down there uh, to get a chip. I'm going to go get a chip. So, uh Last year I was able to get it in, in New York. Tonight. This year I'll be in San Diego. So. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, when did you decide, like, okay. Uh, oh, okay, uh, so here's what happened. So, so we went what it was like. Now we're into what happened. All right, so, I mean, look, for, for my last three years of drinking, every day was like, I'd wake up in the morning and go, all right, that's it. Like, I'm not doing this again today. Not again today. By about one o'clock in the afternoon, I'd be like, where am I going drinking tonight? You know what I mean? Like, you know, but every morning for three years was like, oh, not today, not today. Um, but but I, I got into this cycle of, of 
you know, excuses of why I, I, why I can drink tonight. Why can I, you know, it's like, it's like, oh, Tuesday, you know, or, you know, what, Wednesday night. Well, I can't quit today because, you know, Friday's the day after tomorrow. I can't quit before the weekend, you know, and I, you know, so the, I'd be possible to get through the weekend without drinking, you know, and then Sunday would come along and I'd be like, well, it's technically still the weekend, right? Uh, and then Monday would come along and I'd be like, yeah, who can get through a Monday without a drink? Um, you know, and then, but you were working through all this. Yeah. You had a and, job. Yeah. And then Tuesday was like new release night at Blockbuster. <laughs> right. So who I, can watch a new movie without? I can't watch a new movie sober. Like, you know, so I did that. And then I like that every night for, for, for years, uh, every day for years. And, um, and then eventually like, uh, cause I was, a. Uh, uh, director of, uh, I mean, a, a manager of live action um, shows up at Universal, and after nine eleven, the, uh, the the whole, I mean, the whole entertainment business, and especially tourism and everything, just tanked, and so they laid like twenty percent off of, of, of their staff, and I got caught in that. So I was, you know, I went off and I did some directed some films and things, and I came back and uh, and, I, and now I'm like, now what do I do? You know what I mean? Like I had nothing but time to sit around yeah. and and. <laughs> Uh, you know, and so the days just started blending together. Like I, I couldn't, cause I'd just be, you know, I'd drink all night and then sleep all day and then get up and start all over again. And I finally got to the point where it's like, you know, there were times that I would take a 30 day break. Like I'd say, I'm not going to drink for 30 days. And I would stop for like 30 days. And, um, so I said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to take a 30 day hiatus. Right. I'm just going to, you know, just get myself detoxed and, and cleaned up. But I didn't think I was. I don't think I had a problem. Like, I'm not an alcoholic, right? That guy begging for change underneath the freeway that, off the ramp. He's an alcoholic. Right. I'm not an alcoholic. I still got an apartment. I've got a nice car. I've got money in the bank. Uh, but that was the other thing, too, is that the money was starting to dwindle. And I was unemployable. Like, who's going to want to hire me, right? You know, even though I had done some work and stuff, I would just, you know, you have to, if you want to, if you're a freelance, you got to be out there hustling. Right. And I had, I was not, no you time. know, <clears throat> no. Who's got time for that? No, I had to drink. Um, and so, so I said, well, I'm just going to, I said, I'm, the money's running out. I need to do something, right? So I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to put it up for, for 30 days and, and then I'm going to go out and hustle and get some more work and, you know, uh, book some jobs. And so I'm not going to drink today. So. I sat there and uh, in my in my apartment, and I paced around and I paced around, and uh, found myself standing in a liquor store, buying a bottle of of wine. And I got home and I poured a glass and I brought it up to my lips and I went, "What the hell am I doing?" I said I wasn't going to do this, so I poured it down the sink and I poured all the, all the booze down, poured it all out, paced in my in my living room back and forth for a few minutes and then 10 minutes later I was standing in the liquor store again. Wow. By another, another I got home did the same thing. Got oh well, no, I'm not going to do this. Yes? Yeah, and I poured it all down. I did that probably 3 or 4 times that night. I think the guy in the liquor store thought I was insane cuz every every like 30 minutes I'm back there buying another completely bottle. Sober. Yeah, completely sober. And um and that was when I went I can't I can't do this. Like I don't. I I literally can't. This is the first time I, I was not able to, to stop, and so, uh, and and we, it was this. This is two thousand three. So we had internet, but for whatever reason, I went to the phone book. Uh, uh, I don't know at the time. I think uh, I don't know. I have no. I have no. I have no excuse. But I just went to the phone book and and I found AA, and I called the uh, the the hotline. And uh, uh, at the central office or wherever, and uh, I said, you know, I don't know what, a, you know, I think I need, I think I need a meeting. Now I had been to a meeting probably uh, seven years earlier than that when I was in my twenties, and I'd gone into this meeting and the same thing, and I, you know, went down. And it was in the basement of this church, and it was in summer, and it was hot, and it was. Gross, and everybody in that room was 20 years my senior. I'm like, what am I doing Dude, here? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, this is not. And I'm listening to these people tell their pathetic stories, and like this one guy's like, oh, I was sober for a year, and 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 then I relapsed, and I was like, what a loser! You know what I mean? <laughs> like, what well, this loser? Yeah. Like, if I could stay sober for a year, I'd never drink again. This is what I'm thinking. And um, uh, and so so to go back to an AA meeting was like, oh man, I don't know if I want to do this. 
Um, but she said it just happens that uh, you know tonight there's a it was a Thursday night and there's a uh, um, a newcomer meeting in Burbank, which is where I was living, and um, it's just, it's it's aimed at the newcomer. And so uh, I went there and it was packed with people and the, and it was in this little church. It, it, the Burbank group was actually in, in transition between. Um, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, clubs and where they were staying. So they were in this transition, this little unity church in, in Burbank. And again, it was a small little tiny room with no air conditioning. It was June 5th. I mean, I just remember, I'm, and now I'm not, I haven't drank, so I'm sweating oh, anyway. Man. And I'm sitting- The after Oh yeah. yeah, and I'm, I'm sitting back on death row and, and, and listening to people, and people are talking and they're saying things in unison and they're clapping. And I'm like, what the hell did I walk into? Like, what kind of- like I'm backing out the door with my hand on my wallet. Like what kind of cult did I just walk into? And I thought, you know, this was a hard thing for me to come here. And so I'm not leaving until I talk to somebody. And the guy who was, uh, who was uh, speaking that night actually wound up being my sponsor. Um, but he was, a, he was a celebrity and I recognized him. And I thought, I know him, I'm gonna talk to him. Right. And he wound up giving me his phone number and, you know, and, and I met another guy who also gave me his phone number and he was like, um, you know, just keep coming back. And I said, uh, so that night I went straight home and got drunk. But it was the first time in my entire life that it didn't work. I was like, I'd got just enough program that it totally screwed up my dream. Everything else, yeah. And I was like, damn it. Yeah. And the next day was June 6th. That was my sobriety date. And I went back and I, and I never drank again wow. since then. Um, that's how I got into the rooms. And, and again, but it still took me a good, I'd say, four to six months to, to make it through the first step, to admit. Because I was, I just didn't think, you, you, I'm not an alcoholic. And I, I think a lot of people in any kind of um, addiction program, you could be in overeaters, you could be alcoholics, you could be smokers, whatever it is. I think a lot of times we have that first moment where like, I'm not them. Right. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I, I can. And then you start thinking, it's like, oh shit, I can't. I, I. Well, I think so many people have addictions that they don't even know they have. Oh, told, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, like whether even if it's, you know, food, so especially in the US, you know, anything that kind of gets that dopamine pumping, you know what I mean? That's an escape, yeah. you know, um, um, you know, or, or just, you know, or, 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 or mo emotional dependence, or I can't even tell you how many people in the rooms have, have, uh, prescription dependencies, yeah. you know what I mean? Who are just able to find a doctor who's going to give them, oh, but it's prescribed, so I'm fine. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. my latest thing is sodas. Oh, that's, yeah. I, I was... Caffeine. Yeah. I, I, can't, I can't let go of coffee yet, but I have been off Coca-Cola for like two weeks now. See, I love my soda. And yesterday I had a, a major migraine and, and, and headache, and I was, I was having a little withdrawal moment, and I was like, we ordered dinner last night, I was like... Oh, and get me a Coke. Yeah. And Chris is like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I was like, ah. Oh. Well, see, that, see, because see, I drank coffee, especially when I got sober, I switched, you know, started drinking coffee. I never drank coffee. I was never a coffee drinker. And then I went on this, like, I don't even remember what the diet was, like South Beach or something, and, and, and it, you, you're not supposed to drink any caffeine. So I, so I gave up coffee, and I got the worst caffeine headache. For like two days, I had a headache, and I went, that's not good. You know what I mean? So that's when I quit drinking coffee. But then, like, my, like I still drink, you know. And I almost took one when I walked in. Yeah. He offered me this, and I was like, Ugh. But the, my thing is that people will say, oh, aspartame, man, it's going to kill you. And I'm like, look, I gave, up, I gave up drinking, drugs, smoking, sugar, you know, flour. Just let me have, let me have my Diet Coke. I gave up coffee. Like, just give me my Diet Coke. Let me have a Coke. Yeah, let me have a diet. For those of you watching us, we are at uh, 345 now. We've been on the air for 45 minutes. Uh, it goes by quick. This is Putting Together Conversations. I'm your host, Daniel Garza, with my co-host today, no uh, guy Nolan. I was going to say Nolan Ryan. That's Texas. I'll talking. take his money. Um, <laughs> we are talking about recovery. The funny things about recovery, 
Uh, again, this is our personal stories. We're just sharing uh, our adventures, mostly because I'm celebrating 12 years clean and sober today. And uh, for those of you who missed the first part, this is the cap that I wore during rehab. I wore, oh wow, it's, so, it's, so, <laughs> it's crunchy. It's crunchy, man. <laughs> I've had this cap for 13 years and I wore it for that. Now, now why did you never wear it again afterwards? Uh, let me cry. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of people that doubted that I could make it through uh-huh. rehab. Uh, some of my best friends uh, that knew that I was going to rehab were like, we'll, we'll see you at the bar when you get out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did. I remember the day before I went to, okay, long story short, I went to uh, court on Tuesday, I still remember, I went to court on Tuesday and they were like, um, we will, we're will we gonna make a decision whether you can go to rehab or jail. So on Wednesday, my probation officer called and said, the judge does not believe you have a problem and you're trying to get out of jail. Because I was going to my probation officer's checkup, uh, check-ins high, and all my UAs were coming out dirty. But you didn't have a problem. But I didn't have a problem. <laughs> but the judge needed confirmation. So on Thursday night, I went out and, and partied. No, no, no. On Monday night, that's when I had to go to court. She had called me Monday and said, you need to come to court tomorrow, on Tuesday. So on Tuesday morning, I showed up high and drunk. And my, they had, my probation officer was like, what, what the fuck are you doing? So when I, I was the first one on the docket. When I went up to the court, the judge, and she was like, Mr. Garcia, I, I don't believe you have a problem. I started crying. I was bawling. Um, and I said, all I can tell you is that if, if I go home right now, I will not make it. I, I was tired. Uh, I wasn't getting the help on my own that I needed. Mm-hmm. I'm like, if I go home now, I'm not gonna make it. Hmm. Like I, I, that was my first, as an adult, my first suicidal thought. Hmm. Like I'm not, I, I don't want this. I don't Did want you ever it. have depression? Yeah. Oh, okay. So then, probation officer called me and said, "You're going in on Friday. Check in on Friday." So on Friday, I went in. Uh, you had to go back to the court, and they would pick you up there. Bay Area, Bay Area Recovery Center in Dickinson, Texas, is where I got sober. Hello, guys out there. Uh, radio, I don't know if he's still alive. He was the guy that would go pick you up at the courthouse, which is about an hour drive, 45 minutes from Dickinson to Houston. The car broke down on the way. It, it overheated, and I thought, this is a sign I'm not supposed to go. <laughs> I still went. This is a death delusion. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I, I was so hungover because I partied Thursday night. And I walked out of the bar and I told him, I will see you guys in three months. Because my problem was coke. I was a crackhead. Mm. Like, I, I can deal. With, but I, I, I'm Mexican. How am I not supposed to drink? Like, that's yeah, what we do. Yeah. So I will see you guys in three months. And uh, since I was so hungover the night before, I didn't fix my hair. So I put the cap on on the way out. Yeah. And then um, friends of mine who were at the, at the party were like, we'll see you in three months. You're not going to make it. You won't. You won't. And one of my best friends who uh, passed away six months after I got sober, uh, Derek. He was my best friend and he kept looking at me and goes, you're not gonna do it. You're not gonna make it. Stop fooling yourself. But I, it, it was his way of tough love. Right. And I was like, fuck you, I am. Um, um, well, he saw me six months clean sober before he passed away. Ah. I, I, I threw a party on the 21st of mm-hmm. December mm-hmm. and he passed away the 22nd. So, and, and the last, the last thing that he did was give me a big hug and say, I'm so proud of you. Yeah. And uh, he was telling me, give me a kiss on the head. <laughs> and the next day he had a heart attack. And died. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, I don't know, this kind of holds that energy. Like, I, I don't. It's, it's so it's kind of a sacred totem. Yeah. Okay. This is my, and like I told Guy before we started, when I am famous. And there's the museum to Daniel Garza because there will be a museum to Daniel Garza. You will see this there. There's a lot of other stuff that I have from those days uh, that are just not, not meant to Yeah, I ran across my chips recently. I was cleaning out our, our, our shed and I pulled out a box and, and found all my chips that I had. Wow. For my first year. And, and I remember getting them and I'm like, 
I'm never taking these again. You know what I mean? Like I, the whole reason I didn't want to relapse is because I don't ever want to stand up as a newcomer again. I don't ever want to have to take a 30 day chip again. Like, that, that's these, a good I, segment. Yeah. That's a good segment. What has maintained you? Uh, you know, I, you know, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I always say like, you know, uh, you know, keeping, keeping, um, working the program, you know, always having sponsees, always going to a program, working a program, maybe not every day, but at least trying to like once a week, get to a meeting, um, and, um, maintaining a conscious contact with God and not drinking or using like that's it. You know what I mean? Like, up. yeah, it's like if I just do those three things, you know. But I, you know, I've never really had my, my sponsor relapsed at, at 19 years of sobriety. Wow. You know, um, and uh, I, I can't judge. I don't know what was going on in his life or why he, you know, what was going on in his head. Uh, um, but he still talks. I'm still very good friends with him. He he still talks very highly of the program. Um, but uh, uh, you know, for me, it was just. I think for a lot of people, it's just forgetting what, what it was like. You know what I mean? Like, we spent most of this hour talking about our, our war stories. But I think that's... And there's a lot of people who are like, in meetings, they're like, ah, I don't want to hear about the war stories. I don't want to hear that stuff. And for me, it was always like, that's the stuff I want to hear because I don't ever want to forget huh? what it was like. I don't ever want to forget what it was like out there because me, in my head, I can start romanticizing. I can start going, oh, yeah, remember that time? Remember that time we went, we do, me and my best friend, and we went, we got drunk, we got plastered, <laughs> and we jumped over the fence at Warner Brothers and stole a golf cart and drove around the, we did. <laughs> and I remember that, it was fun, remember that? that this was the guy running around. Yeah, and uh, so I can romanticize, you know, and I can do, but but but, but then. But, but there's a difference between romanticizing and, and just sharing your war story. Right, yeah. Right? But, 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 but that's the thing, though, is that, that, that I also want to hear uh, the other war stories because it makes me remember that 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 those those fun times were very few and far between most of the time was me spent drinking by myself in my apartment staring at the wall you know and then being sick you know uh just poisoned the next day and sitting you know in in front of my tv and watching game show network you know for five hours <laughs> until i could until i was you know you know well enough <laughs> Till the hung hangover had had gotten far enough out of my system that I could go buy some more booze. That was my that was normal for me, right? The fun stuff was just was just every once in a while, you know, very few and far between. So going to meetings and hearing those war stories is it is what reminds me seeing people take chips, you know, and going, oh yeah, I don't ever want to have to do that again. That's the stuff that reminds me of of why I'm here and why I'm sober and. And, and, and looking at everything that I have now and remembering when I was out there, I had nothing. You know what I mean? Like I was, I was a loser. You know what I mean? Like I was like, whoa, I don't ever want to go back there again, you know? I, I will say all that and if anybody is watching from Houston and remembers this, there was this guy and I can't remember his name right now and I think I blocked him out, but I remember him coming into the house it was like a Thursday night. I was there for three months. Big old guy. And he would sit down. You know, one of those guys that just sits and... Uh, like, there are 28 fuckers in here. Only two of you is going to make it. I'll see the rest of you out here. And he was just obnoxious and gold <laughs> chains and that. And I, and I remember seeing him going, fuck you. I'll be one of those two. And I, and I was like... Because of me, I need a challenge. And I was like, that, that's my first challenge. I'm like, I will, I will not relapse because I don't want to be back here or anywhere and have to see somebody like that calling me out that way. I was like, fuck you. Then over the years, uh, things just kept getting a little better. And then I moved to Laguna and I was like, wow, you live in Laguna, dude. Like, you can't mess up now. And then... I really stepped into my uh, my spiritual gifts, and I thought, you can't you can't mess up now. You have this responsibility. Mm -hmm. And then I started mo doing more advocacy work on on my HIV side, and um, really started participating in friends' lives. And I thought, man, you don't want to lose that. And then I, not because you're here, but uh, you became a good friend. Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll tell you quickly how we met. 
and what I thought about it my first time. <laughs> uh, and then I get to do stuff like this. Right. And I'm like, I can't do this if I'm not in a good space. And, and I did when I was going through cancer. Uh, I was a crackhead for a long time. I did, when I was going through cancer, crave it. Mm. But I don't think I craved it to get high. I craved it because I wanted the pain to go away. Uh, yeah. I just didn't. I sat there in my apartment in Laguna and, and Christian would go come back to Culver and I'd be like, I know people who do it. If I could just get some tonight. Yeah. That but see, listen, I mean, there's, there's something to be said about that, though, too, though, because, you know, uh, you know there's something for, for, as a medication, you know, like I always say that, look, if I had glaucoma, I'd smoke pot. No. You know what I mean? Because if, 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 if I have to, uh, um, you know, uh, take morphine or something for, you know, pain, that's a huge opiate. Like, that's like worse than heroin. But we'll do that and we'll go, eh, it's fine because it's, you know, as long as it's, it's taken as prescribed, right? Um, uh, but, you know, uh, you know, and just it so happens that, you know, with alcohol, it's not really ever prescribed for anything. But, you know, but like it's like, my, you know, if I always said that, like if I had some kind of cancer or something and that pot would, would help, I'd absolutely do it, and I wouldn't consider myself relapsed if it's taken as, as prescribed, you know what I mean? And that's kind of a controversial thing, because there's some people in re recovery who won't even take cold medicine, you know? But for me, it's always about been about intent, yeah. right? You know, it's about intent. And if you're just doing it, like I had a friend who was like, I was like so impressed with him because he was like, he took a Vicodin, he was taking Vicodin for pain, and then he took one too many, and he called himself out. And I was like, just one? He's like, yeah, dude. He goes, I didn't need it. He goes, it was one too many. And I'm like, wow, that's yeah. impressive, bro. So that's what I liked after my uh, uh, colostomy surgery, being in the hospital. They had the pain, right. uh, the morphine on there. And it's time, so you can't just right. go happy. But if you go back, and I'll post these on the page, on my YouTube page, I have the video hours after surgery. I grab my phone. And I shoot, I hit it, and you can see in the video where it's just like, oh man, yeah. And I I, I think at one point in the videos I tell everybody it's like, for a drug addict this is the best man, Cause, right? Because there's a reason to do it. A, B, it's controlled, and C, you know you can't take it home, right? So once you're done, you're right. done. Yeah. Like it was good. Yeah. But I was in the hospital for like a week or something. Um, Nowadays, all we have to do is watch live PD on on A and E. If uh -huh. you haven't seen it, I love that show. Yeah, if you are in recovery and alcohol, drugs, and you feel like, oh man, I want to go back out again, watch live PD on A and E, and it will refresh your memory. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> of why not right. to do things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but. Yeah, I think now I, I now I can overeat on tacos. I can always overeat on tacos, <laughs> which I had tacos before I came here. I well, my that. thing is though, you know, it's kind of lesser of two evils. Like you know, like what we, if if, if you got to trade up addictions, like you know, a lot of people will trade up, you know, their addiction for meetings. You know, they become addicted to AA meetings or NA meetings. Um, I was like, that's eh, lesser of two evils. Fine, yeah. go do that. You know, or. You know, uh, you know, whatever it is, exercise or, you know, food or whatever. You're like, that's all right. Okay. You know, if if not... you're over exercising, that's just dumb. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't believe in that. I don't believe in gyms. That's just, the, <laughs> that's just the cult waiting to happen. Uh, those are going to be the strong zombies when the end of the but world But people comes. do get, I mean, that, that endorphin <laughs> rush, right? You know, people get addicted to that, you know, and that's, uh, give but me, whatever. Give me tacos, coffee, and chocolate. Well, that's, that's and good. see, that's the do, right? If it's, if it's sugar and coffee, it becomes your trade up. It's better than booze and, and drugs. Man. I'd yeah. sooner give up being Mexican than give up coffee. <laughs> For those of you that have enjoyed the show, we come down to the end. This has been Put It Together Conversations uh, with my guest host, Guy Nolan. Where can they find you if they want to hunt for you? Uh, uh, it's really easy. It's my name, at Guy Nolan, with a D on the end, um, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. I have a show coming up uh, at... Uh, uh, the 26th uh, at the Comedy Store. Congratulations. Thank you. World Famous Comedy Store on um, 
Uh, the sixth uh, in the belly room uh, at uh, I believe it's eight 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 o'clock. So come out and see that. Or the Ice House on July seventh. Uh, I think it's a seven thirty show. Um, so those are the next two dates coming up. Nice, and we'll be sure to make one of those. Um, not next week. We'll be in New York next week. But um, uh, for those of you in San Diego, I will be in San Diego tomorrow. If you're there, uh, come out to the meetings. I will post it on my page. Uh, I'll be getting my 12-year trip. Thank you, Steve, who's going to be giving that to me. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, on a serious note, if you believe that you have an addiction problem or an alcohol problem, please contact. Uh, go and Google AA. Contact one of us. We'll, we'll help you find um, where you can go, what you can do. Anywhere in the country, there's a meeting near you. Or you can talk to somebody. Um, but always reach out to somebody. Make sure they you don't go through this alone. Uh, I want to thank you guys for uh, allowing me this hour to celebrate my 12 years. It's said easily, but uh, it took me 12 years to get there. Uh, see what I did? <laughs> <laughs> thank yeah, you, sir. That's the humor. It's humor. Thank you, man. No, I hey, so appreciate you. Me. Um, before we go, the quick story. We met at uh, Cool Beans U, uh, Cool Beans Comedy. We took a class together. I was scared of him when I first met him. Uh, Obvious reasons why. Uh, he makes a lot of jokes about being... Uh, Looking like a, a white supremacist. So... Which... Well, really? Yeah. He looks like every other white guy in Hollywood. Uh, so I was kind of scared of him. And I thought, wow, this guy is going to be kind of bigoted or racist. or, And this is what sobriety has taught me. Is that I needed to confront my fears in order to not let them take over. So I went up to him and said, I want you to be on my podcast. And then he found out I was a bigoted racist. <laughs> and then I said, well, I want more. Because <laughs> I'm a masochist and here I am. But uh, I don't know if he knows this, but I consider him one of my uh, best buddies. Hey. Uh, I know that I, if anything, I could come to you. For sure. Uh, so for now, this is Daniel Garza and... Guy Nolan. Thank you for joining us and putting together the conversations. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.